You know, as we sing those last words, we're going to love God with all of our mind. If you've got your Bible, got your copy of the story, iPad, iPhone, Android with the text of the Lord on it, hold it up this morning. We're loving God with all of our mind. There we are. Continue to bring them. We want to love Him with all of our mind, not just with lip service, but continue to be in His Word. If you're a guest today and you don't have a copy of this, the story is like a good on-ramp. Now, the Bible is the highway, the way, to understand the way Jesus Christ. But this is a good on-ramp to help us understand the Word in a narrative form. If you're a guest and do not have this today, when you leave this assembly, as we depart, head for the foyer, leave us your contact info, and we'd love for you to leave with your own copy of the story on us, our gift to you. Well, we're in chapter 20 of the story this week. It is the book of Esther. About three or four years ago, I preached on the book of Esther. It took me about eight lessons uh, to get through it. And so today, I've got uh, three hours. And so we're going to really struggle to get it all in, but I'm going to do my best. No, I won't keep you that long. The book of Esther, to me, does one of the most unique and one of the best jobs of putting what we've been talking about, the upper story of what God is doing, with the lower story of what man is doing and how those go together. The book of Esther, Esther's name means hidden. And in fact, the book of Esther is the only book in the Bible where God's name or a derivative of it never shows up. And so it really is this great case study of God in the upper story that sometimes we can't see moving in the lower story. But I don't know of another book where God is more active. It's very clear in the book of Esther, it is the death of coincidence. God who is hidden and unseen is more active than ever. Now I tell you what, I haven't been out of the casino, so don't get worried, but I've got some playing cards up here to help me remember the story today, all right? I haven't been to the casino, but Bill Beckett has, and we're going to talk about that later. Okay, okay. Doesn't James 5, 16, confess your elder sins in front of everyone? No, maybe, maybe that's not it. Maybe, but uh, no, no, I'll be in trouble later. But we're, we're going to start our story off today with a king, all right? King Xerxes. King Xerxes is the master of the planet Earth uh, in many ways. 127 provinces stretching from India uh, to the Mediterranean. And King Xerxes, uh, well, we've got a queen in the story, Queen Vashti. King Xerxes throws a party. He threw a party. 180 days, all right? That's ha over half a year. And one thing you got to like about Xerxes is when he's done with 180 days of partying, he says, I haven't had enough. And so they throw on another seven days. And at the, about the end of that last bit of the party, he says, hey, hey, and he's had a little bit too much wine. Bring my queen Vashti in here and let's parade her in front of all these men who are most likely to say they've had too much wine as pudding in my mouth. Let's bring her on in. And so they send word and Vashti comes with this word that I'm not coming. I will not be degraded that way. And so the men who are around Xerxes say, oh, oh, oh uh, not good there, king. If your wife gets away with this, the queen, our wives will get word of this. And our wives will start being disobedient like your wife was. Something's got to be done. And, and so they, well, the king gets rid of the queen. And that's the last we hear of Vashti. And so Xerxes continues in his story. And those same men that gave him some bad advice earlier want to give him a little bit more advice. And in the beginning of chapter 2, these, this is a man idea. Hey, hey, uh, king, you're getting lonely. Uh, let's have a Miss Persia contest. And, and, and isn't that a man idea? All right. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have a Miss Persia contest. And whoever wins, uh, that'll be your new. And we enter in our deck with a, a second queen. And so King Xerxes says, hey, sounds great to me. And Xerxes says, I tell you what, as we're having this contest, all the women are going to uh, go through a year, a year of spa treatments. Say amen, women. Amen. All right. So a year of spa treatments. Nudge your husband. And uh, so enter the story almost as a buy at this time comes our ace and our, our second queen. Our ace is a guy named Mordecai. And Mordecai is just mentioned as a Jew living in exile. They haven't all gone back. 
And he's adopted his cousin. Now she's going to be the queen, but at this time she's not, and that's Esther. He's a godly man. She's a godly woman. We're going to find more about that in a moment. And so, lo and behold, Esther is entered into the Miss Persia contest, and she wins. She is brought into the household of King Xerxes. Mordecai being our ace, our stand-up, superb example of a God follower, hedges against those courtyard kingly gates every day to see how his adopted daughter is doing. He'll give word to her. He speaks with her on occasion. And one thing he does say to Esther, important piece of advice is, hey, hey, honey, Esther, sweetie, don't ever tell him you're a Jew. I wouldn't go over big. Now, I'll do my own bit on that. I'll be courageous. But you, don't let him know your nationality. And she obeys as she has always done to her father. Mordecai, one day, as he's hanging around those gates, here's two guards. This is almost a little thrown in fact and these guards are well we're sick and tired of Xerxes hey uh, we'll catch him at a moment he's not expecting it and it'll be curtains for him and Mordecai who's an exiled Jew who you wouldn't think would be thrilled about Xerxes I go ahead that's my enemy who's got me captive here is a man filled with character does the exact opposite he goes and tells Esther Esther these two guys are going to knock off your husband and Esther gets that word and she tells him that Mordecai is the one that uncovered this plot and well that just kind of ends nothing is done for Mordecai four years pass and uh, history tells us that Xerxes goes and he has some Greek wars that don't go too well for him. This is the, the same Xerxes that Hollywood portrays for us in the movie 300 where he fights Gerard Butler. And, you know, he comes back and that doesn't go too well for him. And finally enters our last main character. We've had two queens, a king and an ace. And now we come to our joker. Haman, out of nowhere, is exalted to this high position of the land. He's second only to Xerxes, and this guy's on an ego trip extraordinaire. He's going to walk around that kingdom, and everyone's going to bow before him, and everyone does except for our ace. Mordecai knows who he is, he knows who his God is, and he knows who he bows to. That would be God and no one else, and he won't bow to Haman. And so Haman decides he's not only going to do in Mordecai while he's at it, this Hitler, pre-Hitler figure says, I'll just kill all the Jews and be done with them in the entire province. And you say, well, that'd be a lot of Jews. That may be, some scholars say, all the Jews from India to the Mediterranean. And so he throws this mind out there that this is what he's going to be about. The word goes out in nine months, all the Jews will die. Mordecai puts on sackcloth. He's crushed of heart. His people will be no more. Feeling some responsibility for not bowing, I'm sure. But knowing that was the right thing. He goes to Esther and urges her to go to the king. Please speak up for your people. Esther sends back this word. Ah, it's not the best idea. Anyone who goes to see the king who hasn't been called for by the king, it's curtains for them. And Mordecai in that famous passage of Esther chapter 4 and verse 14 says, Who knows but that you have been raised for such a time as this. Mordecai says some pretty impressive stuff in obeying and in believing the Lord. Now the Lord's going to do what the Lord's going to do and deliverance will arise. Xerxes isn't in charge. But honey Esther, if you don't participate in this for your family and for you, it'll be no more. And who knows that you've been raised for such a time as this. Esther sends back the word, I'll go. But I want you to do this. You pray for me for three days. You get all the Jews in the capital to pray and fast for three days. And I'm going to go see the king. And I haven't been called for by the king. And that might not go well for me in going to see the king. But know this, if I perish, I perish. And so she walks in in chapter 5 and verse 1, uncalled for, unannounced. And the king isn't displeased. He isn't apathetic in seeing Esther. He says to Esther, half my kingdom is yours, honey. This is the way I greet Shannon when she shows up at the office unannounced. <laughs> that they let me know she's on her way back. And I step out and try to be a good example for all the other ministers. Half my kingdom is yours, honey. And right now I've told another fifth. But anyway, and so this is the way that... Esther is greeted by Xerxes. What do you want, honey? Name it, and it's yours. 
She says, all I want to do is I, I want to make you a banquet. I don't know if Esther's going to do that much cooking, but she's going to make sure the banquet gets done. And I want to invite you, Xerxes, honey, and I want to invite Haman. And man, Haman now is like, whoo, this is it. I mean, I didn't think it could get any better. And here I am invited to just this intimate banquet. With, he's on top of the world, goes home to tell his wife, guess who thought he was in the in crowd? But man, I'm in the in crowd, and everybody's bowing, and there's Mordecai, and he won't bow. And it just ruins Haman's day. He goes home and pouts. His wife says, hey, all the Jews are going to die in nine months. Why wait for Mordecai? Let's get rid of this sucker ASAP. And they just don't build gallows. They build 75 foot. I mean, think, don't think this roof. Think our steeple and then some. They're going to hang him high. This is the Old West. And everybody's going to know that this is not the way you act around Haman. And so, well, meanwhile, back at the palace, Xerxes can't sleep. And so when you can't sleep, what he asked for? Sleeping pills and one of Mitch's latest sermons. No, 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 no. That's not what he asked for. He says, bring me the minutes. Bring me the annals of the king. And just lo and behold, so happily that reader turns to five years back. And he begins to read about a plot to kill this king who can't sleep. And this king then goes, hey, what was done for that guy? Well, I tell you, nothing was done for him is what this record says. Well, we really need to... Oh, Haman, here you are. Hey, hey, Haman, what would you do if you really wanted to honor someone? If I wanted to really distinguish someone? Haman, oh, this is all about me. Well, Xerxes, this is what I'd do. I would... Your robe put upon that man. Your horse put under that man. And one of the lead officials of the city carts that horse all throughout the capital saying, this is the man. This is the guy that the king Xerxes delights in and Haman thinks this is all coming his way and the king looks at him and says, and you're the one that's going to cart the horse around, go get Mordecai and put him on it. And Haman is having the worst day of his life. He goes and, and you, all of this, God's name never shows up, but we can't help but see God moving in this story. Well, it can't get any worse. Well, it does get worse. All... Esther had asked for it. That first banquet was a second banquet. And so the second banquet rolls around and finally Esther gets around to asking for what she really wants. Will it be half the kingdom? And she kind of, I wonder if she kind of goes up timidly. She says, well, well, well Xerxes, uh, sweetie, honey, I bet she didn't say that, but you, you get the gist. Goes up and says, I, I really would like to ask for something. And, and if I was just being carted off into slavery, that wouldn't be a big deal. You see Xerxes' brow drop. Yeah, yeah, if it was just me being carted off into slavery, all my people in slavery, I wouldn't even bring this up. But I can't even ask for anything because I'm going to be dead here in a little while. And, and now Xerxes is in a full rage. And who has done this? Who's going to hurt you? And well, she begins to let it be known that Haman's plot to kill all the Jews, that, that is her people and she will die as well. Xerxes is so mad, he leaves his wine, he storms out of the room. Haman is going to go make well with Esther, and as he goes over, he trips. I wonder if it wasn't on a Persian rug. He trips on this rug, and he's, as he lands on Esther, Xerxes comes back in, and now Vesuvius volcano. Will you molest my wife in front of me? And they put a hood over Haman's face, and it's curtains for him. And about that time, I love this attendant known as Harbona. Harbona says, oh, hey, I uh, got the hood over his head. I was coming to work today there, boss, and uh, on the way in in my chariot, uh, I passed by uh, Haman's house, and he's building this 75-foot gallows for Mordecai, and, uh, well, he ends up on his own gallows. The entire story continues to turn in Mordecai's favor. He's given the exaltation, all of Haman's stuff, where he was in sackcloth, he's now in joy and gladness. Esther chapter 9 and verse 1 says, The tables have surely turned. Brothers and sisters, as we understand this story, we understand that as God is not present in name, he could never be more present. Hebrews 13 and 5, God has promised us he will never forsake us, he will never leave us. Though we understand from other passages, look at this irony, this dichotomy. 2 Chronicles 32 and 31, God left him to test him to know his heart. 
Isaiah 8 and 17, I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from me. Nevertheless, I will put my trust in him. Job 23, 8 and 10 says, I've looked to the north, I've looked to the south, I've looked to the east, I've looked to the west. I can't catch a glimpse of, the, of my Lord, but I know he is still there. In the midst of God's perceived absence, we understand that his plan, his upper story is still being worked out. This morning, I wanted to add to this story by sharing with you a few scriptures out of this story to drive home some points for our life. This morning on the PowerPoint above my head, please share with me Esther chapter 3 and verse 1. A little bit more detail than I went into in the paraphrase story moments ago. After these events, King Xerxes honored Haman, son of Hamadoth, the Agagite, from the Amalekite line. Now remember that. So this Haman, who is so evil, is from these people from a guy named Agag. Let's go back in the story a little bit and read Deuteronomy 25 and 19. This, this wasn't in your reading this week. When the Lord your God gives you rest from all your enemies around you in the land into which he is bringing you and giving you to possess as an inheritance, the Lord says this is what you're supposed to do. You shall blot out the memory of the Amalekites from under heaven. Do not forget. So they've got one job. When we get into that promised land, we're going to be done with the Amalekites. Do not forget. But what does Saul do in 1 Samuel chapter 15 and 19? Now hang with me because you're going, what in the world does this have to do with Esther? 1 Samuel 15 and 19, God is now questioning Saul because he didn't follow out that command. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? Saul, but, but I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went on the mission of the Lord that you assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites. That's a lie. Because right here before you, I brought back their king, Agag. Agag would continue and his people would continue. And way on down the line, Agag would have a people known as the Agagites. And there would be a guy named Haman. You see, when we don't obey God, when we think we understand what's important, God in the upper story really sees where this whole thing is going. Our first point this morning is this, is the power of one disobedient action. Saul said, I, I, just, I just left Agag, that's all I did. No harm could come of leaving a king. And generations later, there's an Agagite named Haman who says, no, I just don't want to kill one Jew, I want to kill them all. And God said, do not forget, God calls us to consider the consequences of our actions. When I go to these camps... I have the opportunity to minister to ministers. And on an occasion about a year ago, I was encountering one minister who had lost everything. He had made decisions in his life. The power of one disobedient action had destroyed everything. And he said to me, Mitch, if I only had known, if I had really thought through the cost to me, my family, my church, my youth group that I work with, and my Lord, I would have never done this. Sin always takes you farther than you want to go, keeps you longer than you want to stay, and costs you more than you're willing to pay. While we are free to choose our actions, we are not free to choose the consequences of our actions. The power of one disobedient action. Share with me now in the reading of God's Word in Esther chapter 3, verse 3 and 4. Let's, as we've looked at a little bit of the background of Haman, let's look at a little bit of the background of this character, Mordecai. Then the royal officials at the king's gate asked Mordecai, Hey, uh, Mordecai, we all bow. Uh, why do you disobey the king's command, Xerxes has said, about Haman? Day after day they spoke to Mordecai about how he refused to comply in bowing to Haman. Therefore, they told Haman about it to see whether Mordecai's behavior would be tolerated. For Mordecai had also told them that he was a Jew. Mordecai knows who he is, he knows who God is, and he knows the actions that should flow from that. 
Obedience can be tough for Esther and Mordecai. Sure, I bet they wish they'd been dealt a different hand, but they don't abandon their post and they continue to remain obedient. I want to do a little bit of background look now into this character-filled ace known as Mordecai. Read with me in Esther 2 and 5. Now there was in the citadel of Susa a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin. His name was Mordecai. He was the son of Jair, the son of Shammai. Now what do we know about that Shammai guy? Well, he was in the line, probably the colonel that bore the family tree that we now read about in Mordecai. Let's read about Shammai in 2 Samuel 16 and 5. As King David approached by whom? A man from the same clan as Saul's family. There's already a red flag. If you're David and somebody's coming up from Saul's family, that's a deposed dynasty, an outed dynasty. They're done. God's spirit has been removed from them. And here comes this guy from that dynasty. And he comes out and his name was Shammai. Lo and behold, Mordecai's great, 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 so on, grandfather. And he came out to David saying, oh, I bless you. I bless everything God does in you. I want to be a big help to your kingdom. He came out from the get-go and it went downhill from there. All his mouth was full of was curse words. Mordecai, a son of Shammai, is from an outed dynasty, from a raving maniac. Scripture doesn't note a lot of people that curse. This guy cursed so much, the Bible said, and he's in there. He's from a fractured genealogy, and Mordecai is in exile. And God says, this is my guy. What has happened to him in the past does not have to be that which determines which will happen to him in the future. Mordecai is not from the best branch of the family tree of Judaism, but he chooses to be a man that follows God in a powerful way. And our second point this morning is this that we need to understand the power of one obedient person. As we look at this, God's salvation is going to come however it's going to come. But through Mordecai's action in saving all the Jews, guess what Mordecai gets to do? Well, he gets to save all the Jews. That's pretty important. He doesn't just save all the Jews for that timeline, but the next ones and the next ones and the next ones and the next ones that happen to have two teenage kids named Joseph and Mary who will have a son named Jesus. Now God's going to do what God's going to do. But Mordecai chose to be a part of the process that saved Jesus Christ. Can we be people who understand there's power in disobedient actions, but there's more power in one obedient person? Let us be people who follow the Lord. Number three, understand the power of one courageous moment. Esther 4 and 14 says, if you, For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise. Jesus is still going to come from another place. But you and your father's family, you'll perish. You'll not get to participate in it. And who knows but that you have come to royal position for such a time as this. And then Esther's words. When this is done, after you pray for me, Father, after you fast for me with the other Jews for three days, I will go to the king, even though it's against the law. And church, read this last sentence with me. And if I perish, I perish. Brothers and sisters, last week we talked about being people who review our lives, renew our lives, and readjust our priorities. Well, I, I don't share the gospel because I, I don't know enough. I, I don't share the gospel because I, I, I'm a little bit nervous. I don't share the gospel because of this. This mentality of a courageous moment here, if I perish, I perish. May we review, renew, and readjust our priorities to fall in line with Mordecai and Esther's. To that college professor who's making fun of our college student because he believes in a God that cannot be seen, remain courageous.
To that boss who wants you to cook the book so the bottom line looks better, remain courageous. To that business owner, to that employer that you opened up to, that you opened your life to, in fact, they're a Christian and you shared with them, and now that person, woman to man, man to woman, you opened up your life and your problems, and now they're using that to actually hit on you in a world that's so sick. Remain courageous, remain strong. To that coworker who scoffs at your definition, of marriage is one man to one woman. Remain strong. Remain courageous. Let us be people who continue to follow the Lord. Ephesians 5 and 15 and 16 says, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. In closing this morning, I wanted to give you some notes on raising spiritual children. Now be mindful here, I could have just said notes on raising children. And the words I'm about to give you, I believe, are from Mordecai's life and from the Bible and from God's mind on how you raise children. But you notice I put the word spiritual in there. And I'm not just talking about Jake and Ashton being spiritual. Paul always referred to his spiritual children, Timothy, Philemon, Onesimus, and others. And so what we're really talking about here is not only raising biological children who are spiritual, but raising up disciples who are spiritual. Number one, be a leader yourself. Mordecai never encouraged Esther to do something that he himself was not willing to do. His leadership was clear. Number two, expect your children to be leaders. Don't, don't be someone who is a leader yourself, but then your kids at a young age, well, well, your day will come one day. I love the way our youth ministry tells and talks and speaks belief into these young men and women that they're not the leaders of tomorrow, they're the leaders of today. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 32 says, whoever acknowledges my name before men, Jesus says, I'll acknowledge your name before the Father. But whoever disowns me before men, I'll disown you before the Father. We want to expect our children to be leaders. Number three, remind your children to be leaders. Mordecai didn't just expect Esther. In fact, he told her to go before the king, and this first answer came back of, I may die. And, and then a little reminding comes into place. Hey, you may die, but if you don't do anything, you will die. And Mordecai encourages and reminds and then number four, support our spiritual children in leadership. Mordecai is not just one who is a leader and then reminds and expects, but he goes and prays and he fasts for three days. Moms and dads, when was the last time for three days we fasted for our children? We prayed for our children. Don't let that be a guilt trip. Let that be something that sparks you this week. Grandparents, you're wondering if your best days of ministry are perhaps behind you. No, they're not. They're in front of you. Fast and pray for your children. But hear me, church, I'm not just talking again about our biological. I'm talking about those spiritual children that are waiting to happen across the street. Those people where we are leaders. Those people where we expect them to be leaders. You say, yeah, I've been inviting my friend across the street to come to church and that's not getting it. Men in our culture are not designed to come and sit in a pew and that is the uh, grand finale of their spiritual lives. Invite them on a mission trip. Invite them to build a house. Expect, remind, support them. And finally, number five, recognize them for their leadership. Let us be people who step forward and re even reward because the world is willing to reward in other ways for leadership in ways that do not honor our God. This morning, I wonder how God is calling you to review, renew, and readjust priorities. How He's calling you to be done with disobedient actions, be an obedient person, and be courageous for the Lord. In just a few moments, we're going to offer an invitation if we can pray for you in any way. And a few moments after that, we're going to see some come forward as we pray for missionaries who are going out. Maybe today is the day that you want to ask for prayers to be a part of a team like that. Invite your friends and neighbors to be a part of a team like that. Today, if we can pray for you today, if you want to be a part of this body of believers, by God's invitation and His grace, which comes through baptism, we'd love for you to come now as we stand and as we sing.